Welcome to Off Watch, our interview series. This week, we sat down with Carolyn Brower and she lifted the lid on those final few miles of the last edition and that nail-biting finish in The Hague. Subscribe if you enjoyed this series and let us know who you want us to be talking to next. Enjoy. Today for our Off Watch interview, we're with Carolyn Brower, a three-time competitor in the ocean race, who, along with her Dongfong race team uh, teammates, sailed the final leg of the 2017-18 edition on a nail-biting three-way tie for the final points available. Whoever would finish first in that leg would clinch final victory. In the end, it came down to, well, one tactical decision and the final 20 miles. All of us that were watching the race, following it beat by beat, know exactly what happened there. And we will come to the details in that in just a moment. But uh, Carolyn, it, you haven't always been an offshore sailor or indeed a multi-crewed sailor as well. You've got four world championship titles in solo classes, as well as going to the Olympic Games three times, one of them in the Europe class, the single-hander. You mix into that triathlons, marathons. I mean, you've done a lot of sporting achievements where it's basically just been your shoulders that the performance rests on. I, mean, I guess what I'm asking is, um, are you happiest when it's just you out there on the field or in a team or are you adaptable to both? I think right now I'd, I'm more of a team player, more of a team person. I um, Definitely started as a single-handed sailor. Um, my career in the laser radio to start off with and then towards the Olympics in, in the Europe dinghy. I only really started sailing crude or it was mostly double-handed at the time in the 470 dinghy for the Sydney Olympics. And then um, my last Olympics in 2008 in the Tornado as a mixed team. In between, I'd done a little bit of big boat sailing. I st stood on the back and I, uh, I did the tactics or I got to helm a couple of times, but no, uh, no offshore sailing. It was only really when I had the opportunity to sail um, with Amor Sports 2. It was my very first uh, Volvo Ocean race in 2001, 2002, that uh, I really um, started um, yeah, feeling the, the teamwork and, and, and getting into it and realizing how important it is, and I guess important uh, for any team sport, but uh, I think especially for uh, sailing, uh, for sailing in, uh, on big boats, uh, but especially ocean racing and uh, specifically uh, the Volvo Ocean Race. And I really enjoy the, the team dynamics, you know, being um, actually just being a, a small piece of, of, of a huge puzzle. Um, that together uh, you have to find all the, the pieces and, and make it work. And uh, it's a huge challenge. Um, I think teamwork is probably one of the hardest aspects of uh, ocean racing, of sailing. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And it makes the reward at the end when you can celebrate with your teammates, uh, makes it only bigger. But, but as you were saying, obviously you did start out, like most sailors do, in that single-handed uh, category. But, uh, you know, you sort of alluded to it there, but, you know, you, you did pretty well. So you started out in the uh, radials, you competed in the Europe's. I mean, you had some big successes in those classes. Yes, I did. I, I think altogether I won four world championships between the laser radial and the Europe dinghy. At the time, it was the Europe dinghy that was the uh, Olympic uh, class or the Olympic discipline for women. So it was the one person dinghy for, uh, for women. And, but I was sailing laser radios. Uh, I, I went to the, uh, well, back then, IYRU Worlds in uh, 1991 in, in Scotland. And I won them in the laser radio. And I think it was then when a light switch went and I really started enjoying the competitive side. And I guess a laser, you know, we're always saying about a laser, I've never had to work so hard to go so slow. <laughs> and it's absolutely true. I mean, there's um, no doubt about it that it's a very, very tough boat to sail. But at the same time, a lot of the basics that you take along during your sailing career um, come from 
a boat like a laser. You know, you learn how to um, steer the boat very, very well. Um, the technique um, in flat water, in waves, and uh, you learn about uh, the physical side, how important it is, you know, uh, just the weight a little bit forward, a little bit back, but especially keeping that boat flat, you know, if you have it just that little bit flatter than your opponent, you will be going just that little bit faster. And so, and, you know, tactics and strategy, um, the laser is probably worldwide, you know, one of the um, most sailed boats. Every local yacht club has a laser. So it's wherever you are, whatever level you're sailing the laser at, it's always competitive. There's no doubt. So I really learned a lot from sailing the laser radio. But as you get better, you also, you know, there's more goals, more dreams and, and, and bigger ambitions. And that's how I then ended up in the Europe dinghy um, for the uh, Athens Games in 2004. Well, I, I, I just want to wind the clock back a second, because as you say, you know, you went to uh, the Games in 2004, you know, you went to the Games before that as well. I mean, three times you've been at the Olympic Games, you know, you get into a team with a 470. Okay, now we've got a teammate. Now we've got another personality on board. I mean, was that a skill to have to sort of grapple with? Oh, definitely. It's a completely different world. And <laughs> being, being a single-handed sailor for, for most of your life, for all your life, uh, it's, you have to adapt. You know, it's, it's about giving and taking. And uh, we, we talk about athletes and, and individual athletes, uh, single-handed sailors. Uh, we're very, um, you know, there's a big ego there. Uh, it's all about us. We have we have a team around us, you know. We have our physical trailer, a trainer, and, and we have the doctors and, and the coaches and and the whole team helping us. But in the end, it's all about just us, you know. And everyone's working um, to make us shine out there. Uh, in the end, you're the one on the water doing the work. So. And you're also all the controls, you know, you, you can't really blame someone else. That's the beauty about single-handed sailing. <laughs> it's, if you mess up, it's your own fault. Um, I, I always laugh a little bit about the fin sailors because the Europe sailors and the fin sailors, they get compared a little bit. It's sort of similar boats, except obviously the fin is, you know, for the big guys and the heavy guys. And, and the Europe is, is, is the, the woman's version, so to say, and just a bit of a finer boat, but, but in a way quite similar. And, um, you know, fin sailors, they were coming back from a race and, uh, and blaming their equipment when uh, they hadn't gone, gone too well in a regatta or in a, in a particular race. And, uh, you know, if, if you come back in, in your single-handed boat, in your single-handed dinghy, and you stuffed it up, it's your own fault. You know, you can't blame anyone else. So it's a huge challenge. And, you know, then going from double-handed boats slowly, um, yeah, you start adapting to even more people on one boat and bigger crews. Well, you, you say slowly, but obviously the Olympic Games was 2000. Then it was the 2001 two edition of the Volvo Ocean Race where you're there on uh, Amma Sports 2. Now you completed uh, two legs. I think I've, I've got that right. Two legs of the race. Were you vying for a spot on that team? Did you get the call? What made you leave the 470 for a little bit and sort of jump into a, you know, a very different beast? Well, actually, after the uh, Sydney Olympics, um, I'd only really done nine months or eight months in, in the 470. So it was a pretty radical, uh, short, uh, short-lived uh, campaign. And I sort of felt I had unfinished business in the Europe. So I slowly made my way back into uh, the Europe class for the um, Athens Olympics. And then I uh, got the call from uh, Lisa McDonald um, whether their team was already uh, complete, but uh, there was one crew member that couldn't do two of the legs. And uh, so she invited me uh, to come for a trial, uh, whether to see if I was fit to uh, fill that spot. And coincidentally, it was the, the two Southern Ocean legs. And when I went to trial with Lisa, I think we, yeah, we sailed the boat from, from Sanxenco, Vigo in Spain uh, to Portsmouth. And um, Lisa asked me uh, when at our first night at sea, she asked me, um, so uh, how uh, many offshore miles have you done? And uh, how often um, 
how long uh, have you been at sea for? And I said, well, this is my first ever night at sea. Uh, so I, in Holland, we, we, uh, we, we have a saying, you, I was sort of thrown to the lions. I don't know if you can say that in English, but yeah, I was pretty naive. I, I didn't have a lot of um, experience. But hey, uh, it's an opportunity um, of a lifetime when you get the call. And uh, I've obviously been following the race and there's a lot of Dutch heritage in, in, in the Whitbread race and the Volvo Ocean race. So I've always um, followed it. And then, yeah, I hadn't really thought a lot about it, but I got the opportunity and you know, you're not going to say no. I remember Roy Heiner saying to me, you're crazy. What are you doing? <laughs> If you're my age and you get this opportunity, then you're going to grab it with both hands and go for it. And um, that's exactly what I did. I had no idea what I was doing out there. I think I was writing my name on the ocean, uh, especially during the night when there was no stars to follow. And um, I uh, I couldn't see the numbers on the mast anymore. Um, and yeah, we, we did a lot of broaching. I was told broaching is okay, but Chinese jibing is not okay. Don't go there. So yeah, we had, uh, going into Sydney, I think, um, we had bets on and, uh, who had the most broaches had to pay, uh, for, uh, all the kegs of rum and Coke when we got to, uh, to Sydney after, at the end of the leg. Uh, I'm just trying to take that all in because as you say, that's, um, that's a, a short road leading you into the darkest, deepest depths of ocean racing, being down there, you know, in the Southern Ocean. Um, was it strange to go from a style of sailing where we have safety wind limits? Well, we're not going to sail if it gets too much above this or if it gets too light, we won't do it. And then suddenly you're in something where it doesn't get more extreme than that. And the race will continue. Was there ever a point where you thought, if I could step off, I would. Well, funnily enough, during those two legs that I did, uh, no, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> I think we reached Sydney after 28 days. Uh, so that was a, a pretty long leg. And that was my first, uh, first leg. Uh, but I remember arriving in Sydney and, and just wanting to go again. Uh, whereas, yeah, a lot of the girls off the boat were happy to have a bit of a break. And I was like, I, I felt like I, you know, even after 28 days, I, I was just loving it. I, I, I'm just getting into this. Um, you know, I'm, I'm getting the hang of this. So I've finally got some, some hours under my belt driving in the middle of the night. Um, and, and, and I'm learning uh, how to do this. But of course, you know, there was some, some pretty uh, radical moments and intense moments as well, uh, where you know, yeah, I, I think I was sitting trimming the main in front of the the steering wheel, and yeah, we didn't back then. There was not the big frames and and um, protecting you, and and I remember we uh, we landed in a wave, and and um, and when the water was gone um, from the deck, my gloves were gone and my beanie was gone, and I ended up with my head in the steering wheel thinking you know, if the driver now turns way or the other way, this could, could end up pretty badly. So I, I yeah, there were, sure there were moments that I was wondering, geez, this, this is a bit hardcore, but I was loving it at the same time. And I guess I was naive. I just, back then, I just didn't know any better. And that desire to sort of carry on then, I mean, worth mentioning at this point that, you know, Amma Sports 2 was an all-female team. Did it seem like you had a path to continue that style of racing? I, I was hooked straight away, like the first leg and, you know, the two Southern Ocean legs are, it was a baptism of fire, you know, it's, uh, I didn't really ease into it slowly. It was uh, full on straight away. Um, but yeah, I, I think I really enjoyed it a lot. And like I said, the, the, the team dynamics, you know, and, and back then the learning curve was so huge, uh, that I was learning so much, um, from, from the girls and in the short preparation that we did do, uh, prior to the race, we, um, you know, there was the, the boys boat as well, Amos Sports One, and, um, yeah, we were sort of hanging out with them and, and being able to work uh, with them and work together, which, you know, a lot of uh, Grand Dalton and, and Bauer Becking and all the guys that are still out there now, 
um, just trying to learn as much as possible uh, from them. And um, I remember, yeah, uh, getting off in Brazil and thinking, I got to do this race, but I got to do the whole thing. I want to, I, I, I want to be back. I've, I've only just started tasting a little bit of, of what this is. And, um, I, I want to be back to, uh, to do every leg and to do the whole race. Um, it was just a shame that it took 12 years before, before that happened. The next thing that we see you with, um, is team SCA. And I mean, that team, that team made a big splash when they came onto the scene, you know, how, how did we go from tornado sailing on a windward leeward, maybe 45 minutes on the water, we're good, to, right, I'm jumping into a team that's fully committed to this race? Well, Team SEA is, was for all of us involved at the time, or just, I think, for women sailing in general, and, and particularly women offshore sailing, was a unique opportunity. Uh, a, a project, a campaign like Team SCA, there had been no campaign alike before. Um, there had been a few uh, female boats in the race um, prior, but this was the only campaign where the sponsor, um, being SCA, uh, 80, and the reason they sponsored a female team or wanted a female team in the race was because 80% of their um, consumers of their clients were women. So that was the reason for them to want to join the race with a, with a full female team. But it wasn't an, an A campaign. You know, uh, to compare to Amer Sports 2, that was very much, we were the B boat. It was yeah. about the guys uh, winning the race or having a go at winning the race. And the girls were there. Well, there's two boats anyway, so let's um, get the girls on it because then at least we have a story, you know, because it's having a full female boat in, in the, in the Volvo Ocean Race is a story on its own. So it's, it's not a bad reason, um, and it's also an opportunity for us as women, but Team SCA was, was something different. We, you know, it was set up, it had a good budget, we had all the facilities, uh, but we just had a huge gap to close against mm. uh, the guys that had been basically racing around the world for the 12 years that we had been sitting still. So that was a, a huge uh, goal, a huge objective uh, that we had. But because uh, the campaign started very early, so time was on our side. We started 18 months before the, uh, the start of the race. We were training and we had the best guys uh, coaching us and mentoring us, you know, in every area of respons responsibility, whether it was a sailmaker, the rigger, the boat builders, we had guys mentoring us and helping us and teaching us and trying to help us to close that gap as quick and as fast as we possibly could. Uh, so yeah, I'd, it's, it's a dream campaign for every woman out there. And yeah, in a way it's a shame that um, it hasn't happened again. We have different ways and different opportunities for women now in, in the race, which is also very cool. But Team SCA was uh, unique on its own and probably yeah, the best thing that happened, uh, could happen to us uh, women and especially the women that are involved or were involved. I mean, the, the legacy of that team is, is you know, pretty long. I mean, obviously, uh, it got a whole bunch of sailors, female sailors into the race and gave them that experience. You mentioned the Magenta Project, which I'll, I'll, I'll ask you about in just a minute. But um, talking to the sailors during that edition on board Team SCA, nobody was there just to take part. Performance-wise... I mean, you won the leg. I'm trying to remember exactly. It was into Lorient, yeah, Lisbon to Lorient. Lorient. Yeah, you won that one. That was a hard leg. I mean, that was an up, uphill smash. But, you know, in some of those earlier legs, from the pace-wise, it was, it was possible to see the team you know, frustrated. What was it like being on board that boat where, like you say, that team had made such an impact. There were people wandering up and down the race villages with Team SEA hats, caps. You would have thought it was the Team SEA ocean race. Um, and then for those opening legs where it didn't quite go your way, did things get tough internally in the team or was it, we know what to do in this situation. Was it new ground that you were treading? I guess to be completely honest, uh, it 
I think being part of a mixed crew for me is easier than being part of a full female team. But in, in saying that, it was also something that I had, I had more experience um, sailing with guys. Um, the, the big boat sailing, I'd done, you know, just the, the, the sailing around the, 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 the boys um, in Holland and um, in Europe was all um, in mixed teams as well. And obviously I, I'd had a really intense campaign in the tornado being the only mixed team in the fleet so that for me it just comes more naturally so i guess it was a bit of harder work but at the same time when you look at team sca i think the preparation was key for us uh, at the same time this preparation was very hard because our skipper and the team was actually chosen at quite a late stage of our preparation so in the beginning you're actually still each other's competitors in a way yeah. because we're fighting for the same spot but once the team starts getting shape then uh, I think uh, it was what we had was um, really really special it, if you look back we started uh, the race with a pool of 14 girls and we rotated two girls for every leg and that that was the plan beforehand that we would do that um, but we started the race with 14 girls and we finished the, the race nine months later with the same 14 girls. And I think, yeah, there's something to be said for that because even if you look at a lot of the male boats, a lot of the guys' boats, there was a lot of rotating and a lot of crew swapping going on as well, uh, which wasn't the case uh, with Team SCA. So I guess you learn a lot as well. Um, you uh there's different ways that that you that you handle certain situations um but because we also had the opportunity to get to know each other very well in the build up towards the race because it was a very long build up you get to know every single person very well and you get to know, learn about each other's strengths and weaknesses and so you know where one uh, just needs a bit of a shoulder tap uh, to to feel happy and to feel comfortable again. Um, the next one needs a bit more of a punch in the face. Or uh, so maybe it's not the easiest approach because you have to uh, approach uh, the different crew members differently. But because you know how to approach them, um, then you do it in the way that works for them, and that's how the whole team uh, works in the end. And uh, I guess if you look back at our results, you know, we, maybe we had, uh, as a, you know, we, we didn't really have a number as a goal going into the race. Like we want to finish on the podium or, but I know for myself that, uh, we'd had a good preparation and we felt quite ready for it. Uh, so I thought, you know, if we, if we can get somewhere close to the podium, that, that would be pretty awesome until we got to, um, Alicante and we uh, sailed leg zero and we felt that like we just got left behind and just very quickly realized uh, these teams are very very good or extremely good um, so we sort of had to adjust our goal a little bit and realize that you know a top three wasn't realistic but I think we finished uh, leg one, uh, 225 miles behind. And then that got sub 200 in the next leg. And then, you know, we had a boat behind us um, in the next leg. And then um, all of a sudden we're sub 100 and we're 70 miles behind um, the, the, the last boat finishing. And slowly we were creeping up and we were making the gap smaller. And I think the leg into Lisbon, um, we were 15, 20 miles behind, and then yeah, the next the next leg we won. So we were showing, um, I think, a, a lot of progression during the race. Um, and I think the biggest thing for everyone was once we finished the race in Gothenburg, we all turned around and said to each other, "And now we are ready to race. We just needed to have that one race under our belts." 
to be ready to take on the race. And, and you know, the guys we were racing against, you know, some of them were going around the world for the fifth, sixth, seventh time. You know, they'd all, they had this huge amount of experience that we were only really getting in that first, um, in that, in, in this last, uh, in that race. So, yeah, I, I think, obviously we didn't get the opportunity to, to, to do it again. But looking back, I think, yeah, we can be very happy with, uh, with what we achieved. And not least, as I say, the legacy of Team SCA. I mean, we're right on the cusp now of talking about um, Dongfeng Race Team. And I want to get to that moment, that final leg. But just before I do, you mentioned before, you know, the Magenta Project. Um, you know, so this is a scheme which helps young female sailors, um, young female sailors that I've come across. I mean, I, I know how valuable this scheme is. What's it like? slipping into that kind of coaching role you know that mentorship role where now actually you know you're being the wise old sea dog that's imparting that information you know is it is it a thrill a privilege to be able to do that oh, it's definitely a privilege uh, and it's a lot of fun as well you know i i i mentored uh, ariana von der loosrecht um, last year through the the magenta scheme and um, we we actually only met uh, in in person once during that that whole time, but we spoke a lot uh, over over Skype and just speaking to Ariana and and trying to guide her and um, Ariana always had very specific and very good questions, so she also made me me think about it. But I recognized a lot of uh, myself in her, and and that's quite cool in a way. Um, and yeah, you, you sort of trying to help them, uh, guide them in, in that pathway. And it's a completely different pathway. She, she, de- she didn't have the, the Olympic background that, that I did. Um, so, but, you know, we learned from the guys because there weren't many other women around to, to learn from. And the guys having more experience, um, we have to learn from them, you know, they, they are the ones with the knowledge and the experience. Um, and now having had Amos sports and, you know, done team SCA and now, um, my third campaign with Dong Feng, um, and again, having sailed, uh, with the men and just, you know, soaking up all that knowledge and that information, it's, you reach a, a moment in, uh, I guess in your career where you can say, well, now it's time to pass it on. And especially there's quite a lot of, uh, opportunities for girls, uh, for young girls at the moment, um, not just in the Olympic scene, but especially also in, in, in the race, in the ocean race, and uh, just trying to um, give them those small uh, tips and, 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 and suggestions and advice uh, to help them um, learn about it and fast track um, in, into, into ocean racing. Uh, so, yeah, I... I honestly hope that um, that some of these girls, uh, and, and I think they will, um, end up on uh, some of the uh, Volvo 65s in uh, next year in the race. And of course, they've got a high bar to meet with yourself because, as we say, you have now won. You are one of the winners, you know, of the ocean race. You're there lifting the trophy. So, so let's go to uh, Dongfeng Race Team. Um, you characterize your previous two campaigns where you say Amma Sports 2, <clears throat> a bit of a b-boat maybe, uh, Team SCA, you know, really good budget, full commitment, but maybe lacking on the experience. I mean, how does that compare to then joining Dongfong Race Team with someone like Charles Cordrelia? Well, when, when Charles rang me and asked me uh, whether I was interested to... Uh, to do the next race uh, with Dong Feng and if where we could get together um, to see whether there was uh, any possibilities. Uh, obviously it was, you know, it's a no brainer. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've just finished uh, the race with, with team SCA and, and thinking, um, you know, now I'm ready to, to race again. And, uh, and I get a call from the boat that uh, finished third in the last uh, edition of the race when we were team SCA uh, asking if, uh, if I want to join them, all of a sudden you just realize that here's my opportunity to actually have a, a crack at winning this race. And all of a sudden, yeah, your goal is not making it around the world and sailing all the legs, but it's um, 
making it around the world, but actually lifting up the trophy at the end. And it was a, a, a very realistic and, and, and a good potential um, that, that there was a chance there uh, uh, for me. So, yeah, it was no question. Um, and I didn't really have to uh, sleep over it. it uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's... Uh, it's in a way it felt a bit strange because um, I knew well Axel Nobel was already um, was the first team announced for the uh, 217 to 18 edition I knew team Brunel uh, was going to have another go at it as well uh, they hadn't fully um, weren't fully funded yet but they were um, uh, getting they were on the right track um, and you know I was joining a uh, a Chinese entry um, uh, managed by mainly French uh, being Dutch and there being two other Dutch boats in the race. Um, so, so in a way, you know, I guess, yeah, there's, there's other people that could be frowning and thinking, you know, why, why would you be doing this? And uh, immediately when Charles rang and, and obviously I knew him from the race before, um, but we, we spoke for, for, for two hours, I think. And when I hung up, I just knew that this was the right thing to do and that this was the team um, th that I wanted to be part of. Uh, when you say, you know, you've got that little shift where you're thinking now, okay, we've got a chance to win this. Dong Fong race team doesn't take a leg win all the way through the race, all the way until that very last leg. Did you feel, were there any discussions, were there any looks in each other's eyes of maybe we won't win this or this is tougher than we thought or was the belief always there? I think the belief was always there, definitely. I don't think we would have won if the belief was not there. Uh, obviously, it was very intense. Um, we were under a lot of pressure going into that last leg, but we weren't the only ones. Um, Brunel and Matt Frey were definitely under a lot of pressure as well. And uh, I think it was more the first half of the race where there were a lot of times where we'd, been le we'd be leading for um, the first half of the leg and then finish second or, or finish third. But um, I think it was a really strong point where Charles... Um, whether I don't know exactly where it was. I think it was in whether it was in Itajaí or in Newport, maybe even after. Uh, yeah, Newport. We had the shocker of the finish where we'd actually probably sailed the best leg that we had sailed until six miles before the finish, where you know we we worked ourselves uh, into first place and then lost it all uh, in the uh, foggy conditions uh, up the river uh, into Newport. Uh, so that, that was quite harsh. And um, Charles was really strong then. And, and he said, you know, we're not going to change anything. We're not, we're not sailing badly. We need to just keep chugging along as we are. We are we've proven that we're fast. And um, we are sailing well. So we, we, you know, you can panic at that stage and just... Um, go try and do something different because you think boats are catching up or um, because they are quicker than you. But we kept our calm and, you know, it, it took a few days for most of us to recover from that leg. That was <laughs> pretty harsh. But um, I think, yeah, we, you know, we regrouped and, um, and, and I think Charles really took, uh, took the lead there and uh, um, printed into our heads that we need to just keep going as we're going and just go out there and, uh, and, and do our best as we have been and just have fun. And I think that's how we approached uh, the next legs. And, you know, they didn't all go our way, but uh, we did keep believing. And I think, I think we had something special with, with Dong Feng. You know, from the beginning, after that two-hour call with Charles, I knew that that was the team that I wanted to be part of, and I had no doubt about it. And I hadn't even met the other um, crew members yet. I had an idea who was going to be involved. And, but I just the, the priorities that, that Charles set himself as a, as a skipper, um, I, yeah, I could really, I, 
lined up very well with uh, how, how I thought about uh, about things. So I and he really made a priority. Uh, his biggest priority was to surround himself by a group of people that he thought he could win the race with. And he didn't surround himself by the nine best offshore sailors in the world. He just surrounded himself by people that he thought he could live on the ocean for uh, nine months and that were they were going to work their butts off and always try and be at their best and have a good time together. And that's the group that he created. And yeah, I think that's how we got there in the end. Well, it got you to that final leg in a pretty good position. I mean, casting the memory back, it's sort of 65 points a piece between yourself. You had a bonus point waiting for lowest elapsed time. Yeah, 65 for, <laughs> yeah, 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 65 for Brunel, 65 for Mafre. And then we come on to this this crazy final leg with this sort of bizarre up and down darting between the coasts, all relatively nip and tuck. Then the boats start sailing out into the North Sea and we get to the crucial moment where every single armchair navigator was convinced that they knew exactly what should be done. You must have known, probably before the leg started, that that was going to be a crucial moment. Do you go inshore? There's no going back. It is a full commitment either way. Was there a palpable tension on board or, you know, was everybody on board or, you know, at least uh, a bidiggery? Was it, was the navigator fairly, I know what to do? We knew what to do for sure. But like you, like you mentioned before, we had decided beforehand where we were going to go, whether we were going to go left along the Dutch coast or where were they going to go right, turn right and um, uh, go offshore. We discussed this, this, you know, as everyone prepares their legs quite well, um, this one we prepared better than ever. Uh, <laughs> we were all very aware there was a do or die leg. And I guess one of the key people in, in our whole preparation, but definitely going into this last leg was uh, Marcel van Tries, who helped Pascal and Charles uh, preparing for the leg. And he briefed us very, very, very well. And he, I guess he, he guided Pascal um, the, the right way, maybe gave a little bit more guidance than he would have uh, during other legs. But he uh, sort of, yeah, the, 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 the book was there, the plan was there, and he had it ready for us. And he told us, you're going to be sailing seven miles longer if you choose to go uh, along the coast, along the um, Dutch coast. And you're going to lose out in the beginning when you take uh, the left turn. But, and your gains will only come once you turn around the corner in Holland. So mm. you're going to have to be very, very patient because you're going to lose out in the beginning. And that's exactly how it went, according to textbook. And I, I remember very well that um, we're up north of uh, Holland uh, along the German uh, coast and um, we had the ley line for this uh, sandbank and we didn't quite make it. And we had to put in two jibes in the middle of the night and those jibes cost us eight minutes. And I remember us saying to each other, this could, could potentially cost us the race, these two extra jibes. Um, but, you know, once we came around the corner in, um, at Texel in Holland, um, it was a straight line. The wind started building a little bit for us. The, uh, the current was, uh, was favorable and, we really never stopped believing but the funny thing about this uh, and yeah I, I tell a lot of people this is you you tell people this race was so cool and so awesome because uh, you've been off watch and you come on deck and you see at least one boat or two boats around you because it's been such a close race all the way around the world I mean we we had port starboards with Matt Frey in the southern ocean you know it's unheard of um, and that made the race so cool, but especially this last leg, when you actually want to see each other, uh, it was the only leg where we probably couldn't see each other because there was all these exclusion zones and sandbanks and wind farms. And um, so it was really, uh, I think we got a scared 
where with 90 or 95 miles to go to the finish, we were 50 miles behind. It was something crazy. And um, we just kept telling each other that, you know, we studied this with Marcel. It's still going according to plan. This is where we're going to start making our gains and they're going to be slowing down out to sea. And it was only when the next sked came, um, uh, we were about 12 miles from the finish, I think. Um, we still couldn't see uh, the other boats. Uh, that a helicopter started flying above our head and uh, you still don't know, is this a good sign? Is this a bad sign? But it was when the helicopter flew away, it didn't fly back to land, but it actually flew out to sea. And then we knew well, we need to keep an eye on this helicopter because this helicopter is going to where our opponents are. And when the sked came, I remember very well, I think Charles came on deck and, and was scratching his head and he was shaking his head and he said, we're going to lose this mile, uh, this race by two miles. And, uh, yeah, that was, that was quite a disappointing moment, but, um, he disappeared back down again and, um, he came back another 10, 15 minutes later and he said, now I've been doing some calculations and, um, uh, I think we're going to win this race by one mile. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I think it was 2.7 miles in the end or something. So yeah, it was pretty close. I, you, I admire your confidence. Um, but some of the best navigators in the world, saw things differently. I mean, Team Brunel, yeah, Mafre as well, Mafre making that last minute decision really to break off and, and, and go right. Obviously, if they'd have gone the inshore route, who knows? Um, it must have been close. The margin tactically, navigationally must have been close because you're reaching in, like you say, uh, along the coast. And I, and I look back at the tracker data, which if anybody wants to do, it's still uh, live on the Ocean Race website. Um, you're going along at about 130 degrees true. The other boats are going, coming in at about 130 degrees true, but on the opposite jibe. And it comes down to you get a little bit of a shift, it comes a little bit more, you know, you're a little bit more pressed onto the, onto the nose, you just get a little bit more speed. Those tiny degrees of wind angle really made the difference. Was it ever conveyed to, to you guys when you were discussing the plan, how close this was? Because the amazing shot that will always last with me were the tears as you sail through the finish line. And I've always wondered, was it joy? Or was it relief that the plan came off? It was pure relief. Um, of course, we had to keep believing. Um, we knew it was going to be very, very close. And we also sort of knew that once we'd taken the coast uh, route, that probably uh, the others would have uh, would take the uh, would go offshore. And I. Oh. I, I I'm not quite sure, but I think Matt Frey, they were tempted to come inshore, come along the coast as well, but they were scared that it was going to be too shallow, um, that they were going to run aground. And there was always that chance as well. Um, so uh, I think from then on, we just had to stick to our plan. Um, we couldn't see the other boats, so we just had to keep sailing the boat as fast as we could. And you know, we were all on deck. We were all as focused as we could ever be because we knew it was going to be a very, very small margin. And after we'd had that ley line and lost, basically lost eight minutes, normally you'd say, geez, eight minutes, you know, eight minutes in, in a whole leg. That, that, that's not, that's nothing to worry about. But in this particular leg, eight minutes was, <laughs> you know, was a do or die. And, um, but towards the end as well, we, when we saw the boats out uh, in at sea and we knew they had to still do a couple of jibes and, you know, we were on a pretty uh, nice uh, mold uh, sailing straight, um, straight to the finish, we, we, we sort of knew and, you know, it looked, it looked good for us. But, and, you, you know, you sort of give each other a wink or you, you, you give each other a nudge but you can only really believe it once once you you cross the line you know stranger stranger things have happened in the, in ocean racing before but when you tell people that 
you know, you've raced around the world for nine months and it comes down to the last 14 minutes or, you know, you, you've sailed 38,000 or 40,000 miles and it comes down to the last two and a half to three miles. It's, it's insane. It's, and I think, yes, especially for, for Pascal, you know, we we're all as a team, you're under a lot of pressure, but the call that had to be made uh, at the, in this final leg was a very, very bold call. And uh, Pascal dared to take it. He, he was very much guided by Marcel and he, he dared, he had the balls to take the decision and we all stood behind him. And I, there was, yeah, obviously joy and, you know, we did this and, 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 but it was relief. Just such a big weight falling off his shoulders. It's amazing. It's a, that footage where you are sailing up to the finish line, nobody's, as you say, no one's celebrating, no one's smiling. And then just at the moment where you cross that finish line, I mean, it was, it was incredible uh, for the fans. The toll that it must have taken on you emotionally, I'm sure, was, was enormous. You know, as a final question, um, through, from everything that you've done in terms of you know, your Olympic campaigns and... Uh, uh, the ocean race campaigns, you've had a huge success with winning the ocean race, lifting the trophy and, and something that, you know, as you describe has taken years along the way as well. You've also fallen short from where you would like to be. Um, if you had had successes early on in your career, if you, if you'd managed to get one of uh, an, an Olympic medal in one of the classes that you raced in, do you think you would have persevered as long as you have and reach this point now, was it the win that you were chasing or would you have, would you have carried on regardless, even if you had, have had an Olympic medal earlier on? Is it, is, is it the, the racing that drives you on? I, I think I dare say that even if I'd, I'd had a, uh, an Olympic medal, um, this win, winning the Volvo Ocean Race with the Dongfeng race team, is is better than the olympic medal it's um it, it's the the teamwork the team dynamics and the fact that you've uh, done this a, as a group and the huge the hard work you know the sacrifices um normally uh, after team sca i you know i have a young son he was three four during the sca race and and he was six seven going out in in the Dongfeng race um it's a little boy that's growing up as well you know I, I wasn't there when he got out of nappies um I wasn't there when he he lost his first first tooth so it's it's a huge sacrifices that that you have to make and um I think the interesting thing was when I did discuss at home um with my family uh, prior to the Dongfeng campaign um how are we going to make this work? You know, I was thinking a lot about the practical side and uh, can we do this to Kyle again? And, you know, um, he's going to have to travel the world because I, I physically and mentally, it'll be too hard for me to travel back and forth uh, going home. It, it'll be too draining. So I want my family to come to me and there's all these choices you have to make. And, and Darren, my partner, he, he was very clear about it all. He said, when you speak about the Paul Ocean Race, there's this, uh, your your eyes start shining and you you just look different your eyes look different so you just have to do this you know it's a no-brainer so but I think and for me the teamwork thing is is uh, is really the reward at the end to have done this with this group of people it, it was truly an amazing group of people and and I think the the coolest thing to see at the end in in De Hague uh, during our celebrations, because obviously we celebrated quite big, but was the the shore crew, our shore crew partied the hardest. You know, we all partied, but our shore crew partied the hardest. And I think that's the cool thing, you know, that hats off to them, because I guess for them, it was the same sort of relief. You know, they had to for nine months and before during the build-up as well they had to always deliver a perfect boat to us at the start of every leg so 
we were under pressure, but they were under a lot of pressure as well. I'm sure that if something had broken or something had gone wrong, that they would have felt responsible, you know, that they hadn't delivered. And I think for me, that was probably the coolest thing, you know, out of those huge being part of an historic race like this one with the point so close um, going into that last race. I'm finishing in my hometown where I could see my apartment from the finish line, um, being Dutch and, you know, seeing the biggest crowd I've ever seen to come together for sailing. These, that's all huge moments, but I think what I remember the most and what will stay with me the longest is the fact how relieved and how happy the short crew was and that they, celebrated with us um, and celebrated more than us. And I think, yeah, that, that really shows the connection and, you know, that Dongfeng Feng race team was a pretty special team. Oh, Carolyn, thank you very much for talking us through your, your sailing and uh, showing us just how much that, that moment and that win has meant to you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Carolyn Brower. Fascinating to hear what life was like on board Dongfeng Race Team for those final few miles. We're going to have another interview coming out next week and you can let us know in the comments below who you want us to interview. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss anything. And thanks for watching.